Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Roseville. We're glad you're here. We're waiting for Jeremy to put in a new battery, so if you can just bear with us, we appreciate it. Here we go. I turned 
to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope, who could imagine so great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace, the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. Cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living. Praise the Lord. Great time to uh, s turn around, speak with somebody, and I can get a battery from my, my box. It's broken. Thanks.
time's a charm. Oh, yes. What I do? Yes. <laughs> Better question. Who's who's reading? Chris Berger's talk here. You get to read. Good morning, Calvary Chapel, Roseville. How are you today? Yes, wonderful to be in the Lord's house. And we will have plenty of time to chat and catch up on conversations that I am rudely interrupting afterwards, right? We do have bagels and cream cheese for any uh, extra conversations afterwards, and we do have a load of... Uh, a large amount of food from what? This pumpkin pie back there? Oh my. There's pumpkin pie back there. But I don't know if there's Cool Whip. That's a big deal for me. Anyway, so let's go through some of these announcements here. Uh, let's see. We have Bible studies throughout the week. Ladies Ministry meets 10 a.m. or 7 p.m. No, 7 p.m. is not there anymore. That should be a note there. Okay. Mornings only, 10 a.m. on Thursdays. The book of Hebrews. Uh, let's see, men's Bible study, Tuesday nights, uh, the book of Lamentations, chapter 4, and then the Bible bus meets every Wednesdays, child care is provided for that, uh, Luke chapter 24, there will be a Bible bus potluck on the 18th, and then on October 3rd, they'll be uh, jumping into the book of Acts, so if you're not in a Bible study, it's never too late to do that. Uh, by my watch, it is September 15th, so we need to start talking about Christmas, apparently, 
because we have Operation Christmas Child thing. Uh, it's an alert to let you know that that is coming. And of course, they do need those things. The boxes will be starting well before Christmas so they can get to where they need to go by Christmas, right? So that's coming. Uh, we have men's breakfast September 14th. Um, that was yesterday. It was, I'm sure it was delicious. I didn't get to make it, but we will have one next month as well. Men's breakfast once a month. Uh, not twice a month, once a month. And we have a few conferences. No, that was yesterday as well. Women's conference, September 14th. So there is an October 4th conference. See, when I read and it's already on here, I'm kind of, yeah. A men's retreat, October 4th through the 6th. Also, we went to the Gospel Mission uh, last night and nine gave their lives to Christ. So that is wonderful. Yes, it was a rowdy bunch as usual down there, but we had a blast. So that was last night. Uh, let's see if we can have the ushers come forward for this morning's offering. So I take a quick. I have. <gasps> Is that the old one? Oh, the mystery solved. Look at that. Our, our secretary person's like, uh, there's no way those are still in there. But that's okay. We got through this. Excellent, excellent. So what about the Gideons? Where is that? In the cafe. In the cafe. Gideon display there. Yes. Boy, oh boy. Yes. Anything else? What am I forgetting? Anything else? Pumpkin pie. I did say the pumpkin pie, though. I didn't forget that. But no whipped cream. We did that. Okay. Pumpkin pie, no whipped cream. Save the calories. And it is free. It is free. Yes? No? Oh, Lord, help me. Right, free, yes, yes, free to visitors and everybody else, we sock it to you, big time. We charge you through the, yeah. If you can't afford it, it's free. Sure, yes, yes indeed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your love and your grace and most of all your mercy. Bless this time, bless these tithes and offerings, use them for, glory, for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now my lovely wife. No Chris today, so it's me. Uh, today we'll be reading from Psalm 7, 1 through 5. Lord my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me and deliver me, lest they fear me like a lion, rending me in pieces while there is none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is inequity in my hands, if I have repaid evil to him who was at peace with me or have plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue me and overtake me. Yes, let him trample my life to the earth and lay my honor in the dust. Selah. Let's continue worship. This song's kind of like an old time hymn. You might remember we've done it once or twice before.
desperate for you. I surrender. Heavenly Father, those are uh, fancy words. I surrender, I surrender, I want to know you more, I want to know you more, and those are just words. So let those be true words that really mean something to us, uh, and not when it's convenient. Uh, we thank you and are blessed by your loving kindness and patience. Loving kindness, uh, patience that is unwilling to admit Knit defeat is how it once been said. Bless this time. Bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, I heard over here someplace. That child is being trained in the way of the Lord. Beautiful thing. Amen. Lord, we come before you and... Father God, it's by the Holy Spirit that we can surrender. And so, Lord, we 
ask that we would be a people surrendering. We've been in First Peter, and Father, it's about surrender, surrendering unto suffering and righteousness and all the different things that make up our lives, Lord, and are part of our existence. And Father God, this morning, as we dig in deeper, we thank you that we can surrender to your word and allow the word to enter into us, Almighty God, and that we can respond because entering is one thing and then exiting is another, and they're both important. And if we just take in the word, if we just know the word, if we just have head knowledge, but it's not applied, it's not, uh, we don't learn it in an applicable way to use it in our lives, it's really worth very little. And so, Father God, we come and we know the word is not return void. And so part of our job is to take it in and to share it with those who are desperately in need of it, Lord. And Father, also those who just need to maintain. And the word is, is, is a maintenance in our lives, Lord. It maintains our, our faith, our walk, our motivation and all things that we need. And Jesus gives us hope as we look at it and we see the future and we know where our destiny is. We know our calling here on earth and we know our destination in heaven. And we thank you, Jesus, for your master plan, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, how's everyone doing this morning? This paper does not want to stay up here. It has a life of its own. We have a letter from Sunrise Lions Club, the ones that helped with the fireworks. Very classy letter, in my opinion. Very nice letter. Dear Reverend Ken, I actually am a reverend, uh, officially, legally, but I never use that title. But when clubs like this or some others, they'll, they'll call me reverend, and I'll say, oh. I say, they call me many things, Ken, Pastor Ken, Pastor, different things. Sunrise Lions greatly appreciate the opportunity to assist in this year's fireworks booth and thank you for the donation. It will help us continue to serve others in this, our 50th, 50th year. Yeah, we're, we're celebrating 30 years, but they're celebrating as a Lions Club in Roseville, 50 years. Our service activities include Thanksgiving and Christmas food baskets, eyeglasses for the needy, scholarships, student speaker contest, wilderness camp for deaf children, sports for developmentally disabled, veteran stand down, canine companions for independence, and aid to the elderly and more. And so that's a wonderful letter. Thank you all for having worked with the Lions Club and having made everything a success. This morning we're in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. We're talking, Peter's been talking, we've been looking at suffering for wrongdoing and suffering for righteousness. And now, where we left off with verse 17, we begin with verse 18. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. For Christ also, because verse 17 and before verse 17 talked about us suffering, well, Christ also suffered, but he suffered once for sins. The just, because he was just, for us, the unjust. That he might bring us to God, the Father, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. That's very interesting. This is even more interesting. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits, lowercase, in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at, at the right hand of God, angels and authorities 
and powers having been made subject to him. Very interesting, very deep passage. For the most part, the Bible is very simple. Very simple for the most part. Men complicate it, as men do. When I say men, I mean men, women, all of us. Make it complicated, but it's basically a very, very easy to understand, very, very simple book. All the books of the Bible. But when you purport to teach through the Bible, the whole Bible, the full counsel of God as we do generally at a Calvary chapel, with certainty you will come to difficult verses and passages, without a doubt. And a lot of repetitive verses. The women are going through Hebrews in the women's Bible study on Thursday mornings. Hebrews is a book that can be challenging to teach, both in doctrine and repetition. The verse we'll be unpacking this morning, the verses, are considered challenging verses, a challenging passage. I heard, or I read on the internet, which is not the most reliable place to get your information, but it is an incredible place for a vast amount of information. I read on a Christian site that one brother uh, has 160 ways to interpret this passage. 160 ways. And of course, that's crazy. That's just nuts. But people will take things in the Bible and they will just complicate and complication upon complication upon complication upon complication. 160 ridiculous. But make me, let me make it clear. You don't necessarily need to interpret this passage the way I'm going to. But I need to teach it the way I believe it reads. After prayer, after study... I will deliver to you what I believe is the essence of this passage. Now in verse 18, for Christ also suffered. We know above all else, remember, Peter's main theme throughout this book is suffering. Our suffering. Christ's suffering, first and foremost, and that we are to follow his example. And the way he suffered, we are to also Look at the ways that he suffered many, many throughout the word, throughout the Gospels. We see examples of his suffering. Last week we looked at some of them. Going the extra mile, as, he, as we're told to do. Turn the other cheek. All kinds of, of ways. Never mind the crucifixion on the cross. I shouldn't say never mind, but definitely mind the crucifixion on the cross. But you know what I'm saying. For Christ also suffered once for sins. The just, because he was incredibly just while on earth, is incredibly just in heaven, making judgment justly. The just for the unjust, he without sin, that he might bring us to God. That he might bring us to God. We always say on Sunday morning that worship, don't miss worship, by the way, because you're missing out on something big. If you're out back there doing whatever, if, if you're working, that's one thing. But otherwise, don't miss, miss worship because worship is a kiss to the Lord. That's what it is. You're kissing the Lord. And worship is when heaven comes down and earth goes up. That's what worship is. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And that word spirit is uppercase S. Now, in some translations, it's lowercase. In other translations, I believe the New American Standard, it's both. It says spirit or spirit, I believe, uppercase or lowercase. Now, number one on your fill-in, verse 22. Christ suffered for us. Christ suffered once for sins. Christ suffered unjustly. Christ suffered wrongly, if you will. And gave it, but, but because of it, God honored him and gave him glory. Verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Who has gone into heaven, 
and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. A final statement, a profound statement, a statement that's black and white, that's simple, very simple. When we were born again, we were put to death in the flesh and became new creatures. And that word creatures meant something different to them back then than it does to us now. Now, you know, if you say, oh, you are some creature, well, that might be taken wrong. That might not be taken well. But back then, it was just made new. It, it, creatures was not a, a factor there. We were put to death in the flesh, and we became new creatures in Christ Jesus, new beings, new people, born again, a new man, a new woman. And this is possible because Jesus literally died in the flesh for us. Now remember, Peter in this book is coming against docetism. We talked about that a while back. The docetists denied that the incarnation and the physical human life of Jesus ever existed, that it ever happened. They say he was some kind of like hologram or some kind of, of spirit on earth and, and that he didn't really have flesh and blood, that you couldn't touch him, that if you put your hand on his chest, it would go right through him, that kind of a deal. They say Jesus was just spirit and not flesh. And so Peter's coming against that. That's something that you see underlying here and there. Like his death, his resurrection was also bodily, in the flesh. His physical body left the tomb for three days and three nights. And so what happened after the crucifixion? That's a question that this passage addresses. When Jesus said it is finished and gave up the spirit into the hands of the Father, well, there was a process. There was different events that took place. And what is Peter talking about when he states that in verse 18? For Christ also suffered for, for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Wasn't he always alive in the Spirit? Wasn't the Holy Spirit part of the Lord, Father, Son, and, and Spirit? Well, yes, but of course we can't, with three pounds of hamburger in our skull, ever think that we're going to understand it all. Most of it's simple, but some of it is a, somewhat of a mystery, something difficult to totally unpack to Greek logic. And we know that the Gentiles, including us to this day, we, our minds are, are wired to Greek logic. The Jew, on the other hand, didn't have the separation of body, soul, and spirit. The Jew was holistic in thinking. Not anymore, but back then. And the Jew couldn't separate those things because it was all one. And that's something to take into account when you're going through, especially the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well. He's talking about what happened in the three days between crucifixion and resurrection. What took place in those three days? After three hours on the cross, Jesus gave it up. He died. We know his body hung there three hours longer. It was then removed, prepared for burial, and placed in the tomb. Now his bo body points out that he was no docetic hologram or ghost or spirit. And then there's Luke chapter 23. There were two criminals crucified with Jesus. But only one of them, the thief on the cross, acknowledged the unjust, the wrong nature of Jesus' crucifixion, saying that Jesus had done nothing wrong. And the thief said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so the thief had a, a belief in Jesus. And Jesus replied, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise, which must have been soothing to the thief on the cross. That very day, you will be in paradise with me. Luke 23, 46. Do we have 46? And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
Having said this, he breathed his last. He gave himself. He released, he said, I give up my spirit from the body. The, the, the spirit will leave the body. But his spirit, Peter says, was made alive. Now, where was the Lord's body that very day? Well, dead on the cross, wrapped in linen, buried in a tomb. None of those places were paradise. None of those places were paradise. And the thief certainly wasn't with Jesus in the tomb. No. Not at any point after they hung on crosses next to each other did the thief join Jesus in the tomb. Did not happen. But his spirit, Peter says, was made alive. And his spirit went to somewhere other than the tomb. Somewhere called paradise. To a place that the thief went to as well. A place called Hades. A place where paradise existed. Now where was this paradise? Good question. We usually think of it when we think of the thief on the cross as the thief instantly went to heaven. That's a common mindset. The thief would be in heaven with Jesus that day. Well, in paradise. But when Jesus made that statement, no one was in heaven. They were all being held in paradise. They were all being held in Hades, whether in prison or in paradise. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Jesus first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Now from scripture, what's in the lower parts of the earth? Hell, Hades, paradise at that time. Now it's different. Ephesians, now this he ascended. What does it mean but that he first ascended into the lower parts of the earth? So paradise in the lower parts of the earth. Jesus' body was still in the tomb, but his living spirit in the hands of the Father descended into the abyss, into paradise. Paradise was below, down in the abyss. That's simple, that's clear. In the lower parts of, of the earth. Now, what would that look like? Much in the Bible, much of the time in the Bible, we're not given a good description where we know what something looked like or, or exactly what it was like. But in Luke 16, Jesus already described it when he related the events of a rich man and beggar named Lazarus. Luke 16, verses 22 through 26. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. That's sobering. Before Jesus' death, not a single soul ever had their sin erased, forgiven forever, never mind forgotten. They only had their sin temporarily covered by the priest. Now, even the faithful people who died in faith could not be presented into the presence of God Almighty at that time in the Old Testament. Because he is righteous and holy while man is corrupt. And this continued on into the New Testament until the death on the cross. Even Abraham, whose faith was credited to him as righteousness, 
descended rather than ascended. The writer of Hebrews states, they died, this is number three on your fill-in, they died not having received the promises. They died not having received the promises. Can we have Hebrews 11.13? These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth, on the earth. Now, we've been talking in the past about, here in Peter, that we are strangers and pilgrims here on earth, citizens of another place. Now, before Jesus' death, not a single soul ever saw their sin erased. Not even Abraham. Even those in the Old Testament, those we call, call Old Testament saints, who trusted in God and looked forward to their redeeming Messiah, could not enter into God's presence. Their salvation had not been accomplished. Jesus had not yet done the work. The veil had not been rent. But God did not forsake them by any means nor would he leave them in that condition. Just like at Calvary Chapel, we say we, you, we are a come-as-you-are church. And that God accepts us the way we are, the way we come. But then again, he loves us too much to leave us that way. And so we are a people who change over time. We evolve. The Holy Spirit works on us. And hopefully, our old ways we shed. In our new ways, we take on his ways. The word, what's in the word, we take on. Amen? And so God had a special place set aside for the Old Testament saints. This place was called paradise or Abraham's bosom. It became known to by the Jews. It was in Hades, Sheol in the Hebrew, which is the abode of the dead. The faithful were carried to one side Paradise, where angels comforted them. But Hades had another side as well, separated from paradise by a great chasm. This other side was a place of fire and torment. The people on the other side could communicate back and forth with each other, but there was no way to get from one side to the other. It's like, if you don't know Jesus, you're going to be judged, and you're going to to, for eternity, be separated from Jesus. We're not sure what th that exactly means, how that will play out. Maybe somehow they'll still, those in hell will still have a cognizant memory or understanding that, that, yeah, there is heaven. And a good part of the suffering and torment in hell will be to burn because you see, but you can't cross. You can't go because the life you live because you, did, you rejected Christ here on earth. And so you're in a place of fire and torment. When Jesus died, his spirit descended into the abyss, into the lower parts of the earth, into Hades. But number four on your fill-in, he went to Hades and he did something. Jesus made a proclamation. There's a lot of misunderstanding about this. In the King James and the New King James, it says, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits. Now in prison. Does it say that in your Bible? Preached. He preached. But actually preached is the same as proclamation in the original language. But to us, preached can mean something different. Preached can mean a gospel message where you preach to someone because you want them ultimately to get saved if they're not saved. Or you want them to change their way of living. But in the New American Standard, which the New American Standard takes more recent, more historically recent found manuscripts in the Greek, not necessarily religious manuscripts, but just language manuscripts, and finds what the actual has more, puts, throws it all into a computer nowadays, and comes up with the more literal, accurate meaning. And 
in the New American Standard, it says, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Now, personally, I don't use the New American Standard, even though I love it, for, for those kind of things, the better Greek, but, but then they also minimize the spiritual because the people who wrote the King James saw the world as such a spiritual place. Pestilence, famine were from God. Blessing, good crops, a good harvest was from God. But in the, the guys who wrote write things nowadays, we have science and we have weather and we, we tend to, it tends to get reflected in some of the newer translations. Now, what did Jesus do when he got there? He declared, he proclaimed, and that's what the original word in the, in the, in the Greek preached means, to proclaim, to declare. It would seem that there were a number of things he accomplished. Verse 19, by, all, by whom also he went and preached, proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now this points to what happened to Christ's living, alive spirit, not his body. Because where is his body at this time? It's in the tomb. It lays in the tomb while he goes, to, goes in his spirit to another place. Went, in Greek, is poreo me, from poris, a passing or a passage. It means to go from one place to another. And verse 22, does, to describe Christ, it's also used in verse 22 here in 1 Peter, to describe Christ's ascension. Same word, same Greek word. Who did he preach to? Those in paradise? It says those in prison. The ones in prison in Hades. And it, that's where the misunderstanding comes, where it seems, oh, he didn't preach to those in paradise, but he just preached to those in prison in Hades, and so it must have been a message to try, an evangelical message to, to get them saved. Those who were, in verse 20, who were formerly disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that's eight souls, were saved through water. How do we know he didn't preach an altar call to those in prison? Well, we have to use scripture, not speculation, not some wacko's interpretation, but scripture, because there are a lot of wacko interpretations out there, a lot of heretics. Paul warned of the heretics. How do we know he didn't preach an altar call? Well, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, the judgment, you die once, and then you are judged. Those in torment were not going to be offered a second chance, a second opportunity to escape this place of agony. Not that would involve the doctrine of a second chance, which isn't taught anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible. In Noah's time, the earth was wiped clean of every single being, every single being on earth except for those in the ark. Everyone but eight people. Number five, on your fill-in, Jesus took the keys to death and Hades. Jesus took, where did he take them from? Where did he get them? It's thought that another thing Jesus did at this point was to go over to the side of torment and take back the keys and Hades from the powers that be. And this would have been in full view of those who were being comforted in paradise. They would have heard the proclamation. They would have seen Jesus go and take back the keys on the other side of the chasm. Now I see this in 2 Peter 2.4. Do we have 2 Peter 2.4? I'm not sure if I put that in there. For, yeah. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So we see here in Scripture that the angels who sinned, who rebelled, rebellion is worse than witchcraft, people. A rebellious spirit is worse, worse than witchcraft. Well, 
the angels were cast down into hell with no chance of those fallen angels. We have no indication in Scripture that they can ever repent and be saved. Because first of all, angels are angels and people are people. Two different breeds, two different entities. God, here for hell, Peter indicates a special compartment there in heaven. I mean, there in, in, in the bowels of the earth. A special compartment for fallen angels, without a doubt. He uses the word, the Greek word, tartoros. Tartoros. But God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to, to Toros. Different than Hades or Sheol, probably. Not something to build a doctrine on, because you can't. Not, I mean, there are those that do and say this is ironclad, but I believe it's not ironclad. It's something that looks logical. Now, this would explain Peter's statement that in 1 Peter 3.22... who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. That he went down, and he's at the right hand of God at one point later in time, but already the angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. And we think that Peter explaining this is talking about Christ having gone down and at that point taking the keys had put authorities and powers into subjection. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, I am he who lives and who was dead. Now, when was he dead? Well, on the cross. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Jesus led the way, led captivity captive. Once Jesus was armed with the keys of death and Hades, he emptied Abraham's bosom. He emptied paradise. Paul quoted to the Ephesians saying of Jesus in Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Ephesians 4, 8, 10. At this point, all the faithful, faithful ones who had died waiting for the promise from Adam to the thief on the cross were taken out of Hades. Jesus ascended, having gone into heaven. Now everyone in paradise was brought into the presence of God, their faith finally being fulfilled that God would not be a liar, that God's promises would all be true. As his promises to us are true, there is heaven, there is hell. We will be judged. We will go one place or the other. All the things in the word that we're encouraged, that we're, we have, there are exhortations for us to, to partake of, will pay off, if you will to use a vulgar, somewhat vulgar term, but we will be blessed, a less vulgar term. God keeps his word. That's why today Paris, paradise is no longer described as being in the lower parts of the earth. Today it's in heaven. There's been a transition. There's been the disappearance of something that was in one place. And somehow, mysteriously, we don't know exactly because that hasn't been spelled out to us, that place, that those, whether it be uh, Abraham's bosom, paradise, or it be the other place where those were in prison, they've tr transisted into different places. Paradise no longer described as being in the lower parts of the earth today in heaven. During the time Jesus was on the cross, Hades below was absorbed by heaven above. Paradise was absorbed. And hell became hell. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul spoke to the Corinthians about being caught up into paradise. Caught up. Paul was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man, he said, is not permitted to speak. 
So Paul, now, because things have changed, Christ has died on the cross, the veil's been rent, Hades is no longer, Sheol no longer exists, and now Paul got caught up and went to heaven. Revelation 2, 7. He who has... Nope, wrong scripture. That's a good scripture, but it's not the right scripture. Oh, no, it is. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, this is Revelation. This is Paul. Hades, gone. Paradise, below, gone. Totoros, gone. Paradise, gone that's being referred to here of God is now what we call heaven. Are, we, are you following? Of course, we know that Jesus' life after the crucifixion was not just spiritual. He had a body, bodily resurrection as well. Amen? Yeah, he was seen after the resurrection. Three days and night after being crucified, he rose from the dead physically alive. Acts chapter 2, who it says whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Death had no power over Jesus. Death does not have power over us because death is the wages of sin. Jesus was sinless. He died for our sins. His body also did not decompose during that time. Acts chapter 2, verse 31. In Peter's sermon... He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. You see, th this verse really clarifies, this verse really puts a stamp, a seal on what we've, been, what we've been talking about. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Jesus had been brought safely through death, much like the eight people in Noah's family were brought safely through the flood. Verse 20, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now, now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the res resurrection of Jesus Christ. Another challenging scripture. Is Peter saying water baptism now saves you? Well, there are churches out there that say it does. Some of you may have come out of a church where they told you, unless you were water baptized, I see heads going like this, you're not saved. And then they'll even add a little addition, a little morsel onto it. And also, by the way, you must be saved in our church. And you must be baptized in our church to be saved. And if you leave our church, you're no longer saved. Yeah, some say that, because your baptism then doesn't count. Yeah, there's some wackos, wackadoodles out there. But we shouldn't laugh, because those churches have people in them who believe it. Now, the only saving grace is that, well, you know, God's going to look at that and He's not going to penalize them because they have been baptized. And so even though they you know, are, are wrong, but the Lord, I don't think, is going to let them be judged for it. They were misled, sincerely deceived. But their hearts were, we want Jesus. We want everything that Jesus would ask us to do. And so we're going to be baptized because these yokels are telling us to be in order to be saved. No, no. But the statement has been greatly misunderstood and misimplied to say baptism now saves you. People have used it to defend, used this phrase to defend the doctrine that people are saved by being baptized in water, but it's completely out of context. Peter's been talking about water baptism. He's been talking about Jesus' death and his safe re-entry from life, from death. And that's the baptism which Peter's making reference to now. Jesus' baptism into death. Remember how Jesus himself had been saying in Luke chapter 12, verse 50, 
but I have a baptism to be, bapti to be baptized with. And how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Take that, you who say you're not saved if you're not baptized. A logical interpretation of these verses is that Christ died and was brought safely through death just like Noah's family was brought safely through the flood. That's why in verse 21 we have this interlinking. There's an antitype which now saves us. The flood was an antitype, Greek, antitopon, of salvation by submersion, a New Testament event that was pictured in the Old Testament. Not of baptism in water, but Jesus into the earth. Jesus submerged into the earth. Peter's main point, don't forget, throughout this epistle, and we need to keep that in mind because that is simplicity itself, and especially through this section, is that Christ suffered for us, leaving us his example to follow. That's really the theme throughout. Notice that Peter says in verse 20, in which a few, this parallels exactly what Jesus said about salvation. Noah's a perfect type of Christ in that he was divinely chosen by God the Father, Looking at Old Testament history, we find that the ark was God's chosen vessel of salvation, of deliverance. Didn't get into the ark. What happened? You died. It was God's divine plan, not man's, not Noah's. God came to Noah and told Noah what to do. Gave Noah the plan, just like God is telling us this morning in the word of God what to do. Jesus Christ, like the ark, was divinely appointed by God as his only begotten son to live and dwell among us and provide for us, for our every need, to make us the people he wants us to be, the people who are the king's kids, the people who are royalty, who are of a royal priesthood, of a different nation, people who aren't better than those out there but are so much better off. And because we're better off, we, bear, we wear... Uh, we wear the armor of God, the full armor of God. We wear great righteous garments. Not to be proudful. We, prideful, we talked about that. As soon as you're prideful, then might as well take it away because then you're prideful. You're not humble. God made this appointment long before the foundation of the world, but no man conceived of it. Jesus Christ, like the ark, was divinely appointed by God as his only begotten son to live dwell among us and to provide for us. God made that appointment. And when you examine the scriptures, you discover the ark was unquestionably the only way to be saved from the flood. Only way. The ark was absolute simply as the means of salvation, and so is Jesus. Now, I'll tell you, it's hard when people, you know, of other faiths and whatnot, and, and I, I, I know them personally, and I love them, and it's really difficult to say to them, and the world sees it as intolerance, the world hates us for it, to say, no, Christ is the only way. But that's what the word of God says. Amen. Jesus is the triune God's only anointed means of salvation. The ark took a beating that the people inside didn't receive. Trees, the flood came from above, and the waters rose from below, and there would have been a lot of rushing around when those waters met millions and billions of gallons of it and trees would have been uprooted and bang against the ark but the people inside did not get battered noah was already saved hebrews 11 tells us spiritually by his faith and trust in god's promises a faith that was shown to be genuine and authentic saving faith by his works as he did all that the lord had commanded to him how about you this morning are we showing our faith to be genuine because we give up the things of the world, because we fight against sin, we fight against unrighteousness, and we live as best we can? Not that we'll ever be perfect. We've talked about that many times. But are we fighting the fight? Although it was by passing through water, the Greek, the dia, passing through, however, the floodwaters can't be viewed as the means of their salvation when in reality it was the ark that saved them. Simple truth, floodwaters brought death to the wicked. But they were part of the faithful eight's deliverance. 
because they floated the ark and brought Noah and his family safely to the new world. But they had been rescued in spite of the water, not because of the water. Here, water was the agent of God's judgment, not the means of salvation. The waters, however, did bear the ark of safety, even as the same waters destroyed the world. Now, in a sense, they, they, they were, were saved from the deadly moral and spiritual pollution that had, had permeated all of the anti, anti-diluvian world. This is true. So, to the cross has a contradictory effect also. In that, in 1 Corinthians 1, we know the power of God is unto salvation. That's what we believe. But out there, what do they believe? Well, the same thing for centuries, for millennium. In 1 Peter 2.8, the rock of stumbling. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, they stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. Everyone out there is appointed to it, but they don't all receive it. They don't all accept it. First, no. Christ crucified the rock to us, but a rock of stumbling to a Jew, a stumbling block, or back then to the Jews, a stumbling block. Alan Stibbs wrote, the ark, the ark passing safely through the flood provides a figure of God's judgment of saving men out and through inevitable judgment. Out and through inevitable judgment. First, God delayed the day of judgment long enough for the ark to be prepared. Then the souls that went into the ark did not avoid the judgment, but rather in the ark they were saved through the very water which drowned others. And because of it, they thus passed out of the old world into a new world. When they emerged from the ark, they literally found that old things had passed away and all things were become new. I like that. This figure is fulfilled in Christ. He was prepared of God to come in the fullness of time. The judgment due to sin and sinners was meanwhile delayed. Then the judgment fell upon him as the flood waters upon the ark. When sinners take refuge in him, the ultimate ark, they do not avoid the judgment due to sin. They are saved through its falling upon Christ. And because of it, instead of meeting their own doom, own doom are brought safe unto God. People remember, entering the ark was a voluntary act. God created us with volitional will to choose to accept his salvation or to reject it, to become better people or to not. God did not force Noah and his family into the ark to go into that ark. It was their choice. We are not forced to become children of God and the family of God. We're not forced into obedience to the word of God. We have to be bond servants. We have to say he is Lord. He is my God. And the word of God is his word. And by the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be a new creature in Christ. Verse 22, and in closing who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Angels, powerful creatures, powers, we know the demonic powers, the powers of hell, the powers of the devil, of Satan, made subject to him. Well, how about you and I? Are we made subject to him? This morning, what part of you has been made subject to him? Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you and Father God, we have gone through a lot of theology, a lot of doctrine. We've gone into those things that usually we, the message of Peter is very practical, and yet this is practical in the way that it practically lays out the plan of salvation and judgment. And Father God, we come and we just ask that we would be a people who would soberly take the word in and soberly live by the word because one of the biggest problems the world has with us is our lifestyle the way we live. And they look at us and they say, look at those people, they can't even get along with each other, never mind us. And why should we want to be like them? They're just as selfish and greedy as we are. They love the things of the world just as much as we do. They're dishonest just like we are at times. And they see no difference. And Lord, we need to be a people where they, they see a different people a different way of living, and above all else, caring and loving, including for the lost and dying. 
And so, Father, we just pray that the Holy Spirit would do a work in us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, God bless you. If you need prayer, I, know, if you, I think every, I know everybody here is saved. But out there in, in, in live stream land, if you aren't saved, uh, just stop, repent of your sins, and ask Jesus to come into your life and tell someone about it. Amen. God bless you all. Have a good rest of the weekend.